my childhood delinquent career was was a real ball. You know, it was an exciting adventure to me. I was a delinquent not because I was forced to, and I mean, I was a delinquent because I wanted to be one. Yeah. You know, yeah, all of these things. It was your idea were, of being good, as you say in the book somewhere? <laughs> they yeah. gotta tell you to be good, and this is the way you knew how to That's be right. good. This, was this to be was, good at stealing. I was enjoying life as yeah. I came, and many of the of the people I came up with were enjoying life also. They were enjoying. Uh, taking drugs, they were enjoying shooting each other, they were enjoying the gang fights, we all enjoyed it, it was a ball, it, was a, it gave us a sort of uh, social status and uh, we enjoyed stealing. You were making a rep all That's the right. time as you put like it, reputation this, this was, this, this, tough. Yeah, this was meaningful to us in life mm -hmm. and it was perhaps the most meaningful experience available to us at the time. But many of the other guys with whom I came up weren't able to perceive it was time to stop playing here and now. You know, if I'd, if I'd gone to Coxsackie, I would have had a criminal record which, ha which would have presented an obstacle in the way of my advancement, economic and social advancement for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this was the time when I had to make a choice. I had to find a way to avoid going on up of, along the roster of uh, the New York State penal institutions. You know, yeah. like I would have gone to Coxsackie, Elmira, Auburn, uh, Danamora, Sing Sing. Sing Sing, and eventually Attica, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Or if is I didn't Attica make the, the electric, worst, by the way? yeah, uh, Attica is the top security prison in mm -hmm. New York. Mm -hmm. And but at, so at the age of sixteen, you just decided that that was it. You'd had your, you'd had your sort of childish fun and games, and if you didn't cut it right there, you'd be through for life. That's right. At sixteen, the party was over. Yeah, but what did you? You didn't have any specific ambitions at sixteen, though. When you talk about economic and social advance. A lot of people who talk I knew, about I, I the I knew problem. I wanted to make money. Ah. I, wanted to, I, I wanted to make money and I didn't want to spend too much time in jail in the process of making this money. Say right now, uh, we go out on these streets and there's 16 year old kids walking around. Do they have any feeling that there are chances for them, that they can make it big in the world? In well, I didn't have any feeling that there were chances for me, but I knew it was out there somewhere and I had to get it. You had to get it. Yeah. You yourself, by yourself. That's right. And it, it didn't really occur to you that uh, being a Negro was going to, well, obviously occur to you is going to make it difficult, but it didn't occur to you to make it impossible as a kid. Did it occur to any of your friends that it was impossible for them? No, I don't think we thought too much about it. We knew what we wanted, and we were so involved in our problems that we never gave too much thought to the social and, you know, economic restraints on us. Yeah. All we knew that we had to get it and get it, and we wanted to get it then and there, you know? In some way. Well, like all kids. I live in Harlem now. I've lived in Harlem all my life. I have, I have never go, I've never tried to be white. I've never had any desire to be white. And uh, I still Rosa know King the people. I still know right? the people on the street. Yeah. Yeah. I still I still speak to them in Argo. Uh, there are very few people around here that know me by Claude Brown. Sunny. If they went, yeah, you know, it's still Sunny Boy, and that's fine with me, you mm -hmm. know. And I know them by well, whatever their nicknames are. We grew up together. I still feel as though I'm an integral part of the Harlem community. Well, let's talk a little bit about the home. Uh, the statistics, I know you hate statistics and you hate social science and all that sort of thing, but there's a certain crude truth uh, in these reports. Uh, recently, a report on the Negro family uh, was made as the so-called Moynihan Report. Um, it hasn't been made public yet, and uh, one of the things it stresses is, is the uh, very high rate of illegitimacy uh, in Harlem. I don't know, something like 44% of all births uh, last year. And it, uh, it talks about the difficulty of kids growing up with an absent father, which, of course, was not your case. Uh, uh, you, uh, you did grow up with a, with a family, a father and mother and, and uh, uh, sisters and a brother. Uh, just one brother, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, uh, do you feel that uh, this is a really crucial problem? I mean, from the way you look at it, say, from the... Uh, the way you look at it as a, as a Harlem kid, uh, or do you think that uh, this sort of anal analysis is misguided? And, uh, Tell me something. Why do, you think that, why do you think that various uh, government, city and federal government agencies are always so anxious to come up with a report? You know, the people in Harlem don't need any reports. What do they need? The people in Harlem need people who are sincerely interested in them as members of the power structure. What they need is genuine representation. Right. And this is something which they yeah, don't how have. Do, yeah, but how do they get it? That's, uh, we, we started talking about that before. How do they get it? How do they get it? They get it by 
by the power structure, the administration. Uh, Which power structure away, are you talking about now? And the general from, now. from the Harlem power structure on up, mm -hmm. you know, throughout to the federal to the top, the federal power structure. All right. Yeah, the White the House stations, on down. Yeah, just you know. Go here and study the communities themselves. Don't sit around and give something to some psychologist who knows less about it than they do, actually. He's been, he's been sleeping in a book all of his life. <laughs> They're going to give it to him and say, yeah, tell me about those Negroes. And all he gets is a psychological yeah. report that says nothing. Uh, well, nevertheless, uh, it says something when you're, talk when you're talking about Harlem and you're wondering, for example... I'll tell you what it says, Norman. Yeah, you know what it says? says? It says, well, here is the most recent word on on the Negro community. And now you can take this and mull over it for another couple years and uh, forget the Negro until that time. That's you, all it has said. That's all it says today. Well, you still, though, haven't answered my question, the, the, the one I started with, uh, which is, do you think that, that this business of, uh, of illegitimacy, of uh, large numbers of illegitimate illegitimacy kids is Illegitimacy is no big problem, really. Why not? Because people will, look, you, you, you give people, you give people uh, nothing materially, nothing spiritually, or well, what have they got? They've mm -hmm. got instincts and urge. Sex is the most natural thing in the world. Yeah, but that, that doesn't mean that it's not a big problem. Yeah, well, yeah it's, it, look, it's, it's not a problem here that the community isn't that concerned about it. If they're so concerned about the, what, you know, you know what, you know what you're saying, actually? Well, I'm asking, that, I'm not saying. You're saying, not yet, now anyway. wouldn't it be nice if we could get the Negroes to uh, accept what little they have in the ghettos throughout the nation and still not have too many illegitimate children. Why should the Negroes who've been so deprived in this country no, you, for no, so long yeah, no, worry, is... about, worry about the power structure's um, disturbance over the Ill high rate of illegitimacy? Nobody is suggesting that they ought to worry about the power structure's disturbance. The question is whether this is a factor. No, but that's, uh, a, whether that's, this that's is not a... the problem. It's merely a symptom of the overall problem, illegitimacy, right, drug addiction. Right. Why doesn't anybody say anything well, about drug talk, addiction? Yeah, let's talk about drugs. Yeah. Uh, in the book, uh, drugs, are, drugs are, the, are the villain in your book. You say when? About 1955, it swept Harlem like a yeah. plague, and uh, uh, you, thank God, escaped from it. Uh, why do you think drugs uh, took over in the way they did all of a sudden? You see, my generation was in almost total rebellion. They were rebelling, rebelling against the uh, previous generation, our parents. We were rebelling against the power structure. We were rebelling against the adult world. We were rebelling against almost everything, all forms of authority. Mm -hmm. And it's like dr drugs came at a time when it, gave, when it gave some substance to our rebellion. If we wanted to say that we were different from our parents who had come from the South and who were happy to work in Goldberg's house and scrub his floors and work downtown for 40 and $50 a week and think they're doing good, it's like, well, how could we show that we were so different? We were living in the same houses with them. We were accepting the same social and economic conditions as they were accepting. So what made us so different? Well, I'll tell you, one of the, one of the, of the most prominent features of our behavior that distinguished us from our parents was the fact that in 1950, when, when drugs began to pour into Harlem, we went to drugs. We used, we used drugs. We got high off heroin. We nodded, but we were cool. We didn't do like our parents had been doing since the plantation days, getting drunk on Saturday night and going around cutting each other up, hitting each other in the head with axes and meat cleavers and shooting each other. All we did, we got high and we nodded and we became lost in our own selves. You weren't violent. And this was a distinguishing mean, feature. Cool? That's right. Yeah. It was part of the rebellion. Yeah. And it was a rebellion, in this case, against violence. Uh, was it, partly, no, 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 not okay. so much against violence. Violence was merely a, a single aspect of our parents' behavior, mm -hmm. and it was a, rebell a rebellion against being identified with our with parents. Them. Yeah, to the entire white society. Mm -hmm. yeah. To the entire white society. Yeah. But you yourself always knew that drugs were, were, was bad business. Uh, you, you escaped it from the beginning, and you always knew it was the worst kind of thing. Uh, you think that uh, you think that the legalization? I didn't always know this was the worst kind of thing. I would have been a drug addict had I not had such a traumatic experience. The first time. And my first attempt Tell at getting now. high off drugs. Well, it. I thought I was going to die, mm -hmm. and so I never went on. But the other two people who tried it with me for the first time, they went on to become drug addicts, and a majority of many many people who tried it for the first time, even though they got sick, almost deathly sick. They, they still went on to become drug addicts. Mm -hmm. Well, Claude, some of what you say sort of implies that you're not terribly concerned 
about the the idea or the ideal of integration. Uh, is that true? I mean, that is, do you look forward to a time when uh, whites and Negroes will be living side by side together everywhere with no regard for color? Or do you think that that's a less important Norman, Norman, goal? Norman, than... Norman, Norman, Norman. To be realistic, when speaking about integration, look, there's alienation even within ethnic groups. There there's sure discrimination is. within ethnic groups. You can't tell, you can't tell some, some guy who... Uh, who doesn't like drinking, you know, and who doesn't like violence to live next door to guys always getting drunk and beat up and beating up his wife. Mm -hmm. like, it's the same thing. You can't tell a Negro, like, look, there's some nice white people's go, uh, people around, go and live with them, or there's some nice Negroes, go and live with them. I don't think this is really important. Uh -huh. If you treated, if you treated Negroes as fairly as whites were treated in the country, the power structure treated them, that is, mm -hmm. uh, there would be no, there would be no clamor for integration. I don't think Negroes are too anxious to live among white people. They, they, they would just like to have the freedom to live wherever they chose. Uh, while you were talking before, I sensed a certain kind of anger in you <clears throat> and a certain kind of bitterness. Have you changed since the book was written, or am oh, I wrong in my not. reading no, of the no, book? No, 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 no. You see, uh, I, I was bitter. It's natural for any Negro book to be bitter, bitter. Towards, the, towards the white society. But as I was coming up, I was releasing all of my bitterness throughout my childhood. Mm -hmm. That's what my, my delinquent activities were all about. You know, it was a rebellion. It was more and rebellion against time, your yeah, parents yeah, than yeah, against this is the closely, whites, wasn't no, it? No, no, no. Against, I, did, I stole very little from my parents. They had very little to steal. Yeah. yeah I stole more from the white society. I mean, you were me. rebelling against the down home. I told you, we thing. were rebelling against everything. everything. You know, that's right. You know, from the top on down. Mm -hmm. now, what you just said about my lack of bitterness, it's like I can't, I can't go around, I could never become a black chauvinist because I have, I have been, I've been, well, helped along the way, you know, immensely by white people. It's hard for somebody, like if you're laying down on the ground, dying, you know, and, and some Negro has, has, has stabbed you and laid you down there and left you to bleed. And a lot of other Negroes come by and, and watch you, you know, and step over you or step on you on the way. And uh, some white man comes and picks you up. How do you say, oh, that no good white man, let me kill him? You've got to be a madman. Yeah, yeah so mad where do you man. get the bitterness for? Uh, all I can say is that in about uh, four or eight years, uh, I hope uh, we're going to be seeing you as Congressman Brown. <laughs> I hope so too, Norm. It's been fun.